Hello and welcome to Best in Heritage. My name is Kevin McLean, speaking to you from Blackfoot Territory in Southern Alberta, Canada. My guest is Matt Wakefield, CEO of the National Emergency Services Museum in Sheffield, England. Today, he will be sharing on visitor experience and engagement at NESM, which is found to be so meaningful and rewarding that the UK's Kids and Museums organization honored it with its Family Friendly Museum Award. Kids and Museums mission is to work with museums across the UK and I see across the planet too, to make them more welcoming of children, young families and young people. Welcome Matt, congratulations to you on this remarkable achievement. Thank you very much. Thank you. So maybe if you can start by uh, describing briefly the National Emergency Services Museum, any NESM. Um, I say it's uh, we've changed massively over the years, and especially through the uh, the pandemic as well. But um, long story short, we used to be back in 1931 just a simple fire service museum in the back of a fire station, and then over the years transformed and moved into uh, the museum that we are today, that is the United Kingdom's main museum for all of the emergency services, whether it be the fire service, the police, the ambulance, the RNLI, the Coast Guard, the RSPCA goes on and on into quite a lot of different uh, different services. And uh, we are based in the centre of Sheffield in a Victorian combined police, fire and ambulance station. So uh, sort of a historic home, historic building. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a small team of people, but mighty in everything that we do is all we keep saying. <laughs> That's amazing. So maybe you can share a bit on, on the evolution of the site uh, and how it came to be honoured last year with the Family Friendly Museum Award, recognising sites that go the extra mile to provide a great experience to families. Yeah. So we've gone through quite a few changes over this last few years, um, mainly from being a volunteer run museum as sort of a retired firefighter's hobby into the actual museum that we are today. Um, and sort of professionalised a lot as well in, in what we do and, and how we've changed. And I think, again, COVID and the pandemic was a perfect time for us to bring absolutely everything we did to a complete stop and rejig, relook at absolutely everything we do. We offer how the museum's laid out and just bite the bullet, change everything that we need to change um, and become the new museum that we, we want it to be. And I think that proved, for example, in our visitor numbers, because they went from 14,000 a year up to 30,000 visitors. So we, we doubled the visitor numbers. Um, we really put families and kids as a, a main focus um, as well, not leaving everyone out, but as a main focus with everything. And I think with the collection as a whole, we just looked at it from, it's not just big red trucks, for example, they're, they're a very small part of the museum and making sure that everything is as hands-on, as interactive as possible, open for all ages. And I always say, however old you are, you learn through play, um, regardless of whether you want to or not. That is one of the best ways of learning. So when you're talking about the, the hands-on bit, if, if you can expand maybe on uh, the approaches to your visitors, to the successes behind experiences had by family and, and children that impressed uh, the Kids and Museums Award jury? Yeah, so we, we used to have barriers around nearly everything in the museum and sort of everything either behind glass or sort of behind chain where, oh my God, you can't touch this or anything. And we realised the majority of our collections being designed for firefighters, for example, to go dragging through a fire. So visitors being able to actually get hands on and if they did touch something, it's not too much of a problem. Um, and to be honest, sometimes public want to see something and want to get close. So if you've got a nice, pristine old ambulance, for example, that the paint works immaculate on and there's a chain across the front, public are still going to lean against that chain to, to try and see where it, what's in it. So if you bring that more into sort of their eyes as well, where there isn't chains around things, there's, there's less barriers. And if you need to say sort of you can't touch this or anything, um, have a bit of a laugh and a joke with it, like loosen up a little bit as well. So, for example, in, in regards to that, we have a World War One exhibition and the ambulance that's on display in there, the horse-drawn one, we've put a sort of little jerky sign saying, I've survived two World Wars so far, so please take care of me. And there's, there's little things sort of like um, like that that we can have a, a bit of banter, so to speak, with your, your visitors as well. But then having that point of letting people try things on, have a go, touch things, um, 
and just removing all of that sort of behind glass, everything you can't touch. You come to a museum to just see and read, but you don't. You come to a museum to to play, touch, and handle as well. And we we've always said we understand there is parts of our collection that cannot sort of just be out for people to grab and flip through some books and things like that. So some bits of paperwork, etc., are behind um, behind glass. But then we've had replica versions put in front that people can pick up, read through in your own time. Or even down to some of the rare helmets, for example, that we've got. Um, we've had replicas of them made in child and adult sizes for, for people to have a go at. So it's making all that fun and adding sort of um, smoke, light, lighting effects, uh, sound effects, smells into the museum to just bring that extra little thing to life as well. Um, and acknowledging that, yes, we're in a Victorian building, but there is certain things we can do to make it more accessible to all i.e., for example, with lighting. Um, you can put ultra-modern lighting in that helps the exhibits, but then also makes it a bit brighter and lighter for public, but then adds to the effect of everything and the, the overall experience. And I don't think our team stop neither as well um, from that side. They're always hands-on, they're interactive, they will go the extra mile for absolutely everybody and anything. And it doesn't matter if we have one visitor in, they'll still get treated the exact same. So if we have 300 visitors in, so... It's making everyone feel that extra special and being open and honest about everything as well. So, and this is a bit just off, but where you're thinking a little bit more deeply about kind of that engagement between people and objects, and you can say you get a little bit um, more chill <laughs> with with some with some things. What what was the inspiration? Because it's just as easy that right now you could be doing exactly what you were doing before, but you changed. What led to that, that that change in outlook? Like, why did it happen? Because you could maybe not be doing that right now. We could. I think it's there's a few of us that's always had the vision of what the museum needs to be. And um, the museum doesn't need to be just a building full of things on display. Um, so, again, I think some of the changes that we've said, is, even some of the volunteers that we had here and some sort of enthusiasts that, really do care about what we have on display uh, and, and are sort of desperate to see absolutely everything. They miss, they still miss a lot. So even though you can see everything and, for example, one of the exhibition that rooms that we refurbished during the pandemic, it had just over 800 individual objects in there. And we stripped that right back to just over 70 objects, but put their story around it. And again, even the, some of the volunteers that have been here for years and years that knew what everything was and where everything was still came to us and said, how long have they had that? Is that new? Like, oh, my God, I didn't believe it. I didn't, I didn't sort of know about that story. And again, it, it's about picking your objects. And I think I, I said earlier about um, it's not all just big red trucks. You don't need the building rammed and crammed full of every single helmet out there because it means nothing to everything or every single vehicle out there. It, it doesn't directly speak to people where you can individually pick the people's story out as well. And we never really told that before. So I think that whole change from a museum of objects to an interactive museum that also tells the story and makes everybody learn from an enthusiast right up to sort of people that may not think they are enthusiastic about it or even know what they're coming to see. I like that. So has there been some part of this amazing achievement that's come with challenges? And if so, what would you say those difficulties have been? Um, it's definitely come with challenges. We live our life being a challenging museum. We, um, right now, we're one of Sheffield's only independent museums. So um, that does mean that we have a charged entry, for example, an entry fee, where a lot of the rest of the museums in the city are free. So I think that can show um, or, or cause a... a an issue between, say, families that uh, can't really afford to go anywhere at the minute. They're looking at actually, it's uh, we need to put food on the table rather than go and have a, a, a good day out. But at the same point, from a mental health point of view, you still, as a family, do need to go out. So um, we worked with quite a few different charities to uh, where we gave just over 500 free family tickets away uh, to different families all, all, all across the city that may be struggling or maybe going to food banks, for example. Um, that actually do a lot. Go and have a day out. Go and go and chill out. Go and have a good time. Uh, and I think breaking some of them boundaries down, making sure that yes, we have an admission fee, 
but that fee is covered for your entry all year round. There's no addition for any special events that we do. If we put activities on during the summer holidays, for example, we don't charge extra for that. There's no hidden things of you're paying to come in and then you have to pay for this inside or you have to pay for that inside. We changed, for example, like the gift shop. The gift shop is near the exit and entrance, but it's not forcefully pushing people through. That does mean, again, I know that common thing in a museum of it's exit route through gift shop. But at the same point, you can cause a family a bit of stress and hassle if they can't afford to go in the gift shop and they know about it. Um, and again, be open with your, with your visitors on the fact that we have a, a coffee shop, but do you know what? If you want to bring your own food, bring your own food. And I think it, it's, it's a lot of little barriers that you can break down as well. Thanks. Um, so if this applies, and I think it does, I, I think of you as like, uh, you know, the little engine that could and the underdog that's, you know, winning all the championships, which is great. Um, is there an advantage of creating something? And in your case, it's a museum visitor experience where resources are scarce and where creativity and grassroots energy make the difference, as opposed to, you know, our peers and colleagues that have all kinds of wealth and resources to bring to bear. Yeah, I think before the pandemic, in fact, during the pandemic, I always used to say, uh, oh, sorry, before the pandemic, I always used to say, um, we're an independent museum. I love that because if we want to do something, we find the money or we find the way to do it and we just do it. Um, obviously, when the pandemic hit you, a lot of people thought, actually, I'd prefer to be a funded museum right now, sort of because all, all your entry fees and things go. But then at the same point, we use that time of, can we do things without spending a lot of money? So, uh, for example, some of the barriers around exhibits, and this sounds silly, the fact that I can't really show you a photo of it, but we've used simple toilet roll holders, for example, but as ankle height barriers around some exhibits. Um, and to be honest, we've had a couple of other museums that have said, oh, is that a new company that makes them? Are they something different? Like, no, they're just... £10 instead of £200, for example. Um, and again, using the collection itself and looking at can we display that in a different way where, for example, it doesn't have to be on a ridiculous expensive plinth or, for example, again, when we said about um, rejigging some of the exhibitions, can we use recycled wood from other exhibitions? Can we use recycled parts and can we edit them? Can we contact local schools and local shops and is there anything there been in that we can sort of give a second or even third life. Um, so because there's parts of the museum that have had three and four different lives before getting to where we are now. And I, I think the creativity of all of our team, we always look at what we want to do. And I think everybody does with an exhibition, the max where we want to be with everything. And then you always end up bringing it back to realistically what can you afford to do. We more look at it of, is there another way around doing it though? Does it have to be money that we spend on something or, could we work with a local youth club, for example, to make a bit of art and um, do some painting with us rather than actually paying a painter to come in? Is there a local college where they're learning plastering, painting and decorating where they can come in and help us rather than actually paying a, a plasterer or anything? I think it's, it, it's getting the community involved at the same point. But, yeah, we, we definitely think out of the box on we want to do this, we're going to do it. Now, how can we do it? Because we don't have the money to do it. Um, and things, yeah. I think especially with the actual Kids in Museums Award as well, we looked at sensory backpacks, for example, and we've always avoided it because we've always thought, actually, you know what, they're going to be expensive to have made, they're going to be expensive to brand up. And to be honest, public really appreciate something printed off your own printer and stapled because it gives them that information that they need. They're not after that information because it looks good they're after that information because they require it and it's really going to help them um and even down to the simple things of we just printed the makaton symbol for play for example off uh, so it literally is two hands in that gesture that is on everything you can touch handle and do and we've had the signs properly printed now but to start with we just printed and laminated them and put them out because it meant that from a visitor point of view, you easily know what you can and can't do. And the sensory backpacks, to be honest, they didn't cost us as much as we thought in the end, because again, you can do a lot yourself. You can go to a charity shop and buy standard bags, uh, rucksacks, and then 
for example, don't have anything embroidered on them. Just put your own museum patch on that you're probably already selling your shop. So therefore, it's just a couple of pens out of your pocket. There's, you know, it's, we, we really went above and beyond with that side of things. Yeah, that creativity part when you're pushed to the wall and you have to problem solve is really cool. And sometimes I think it, it requires that we be more innovative than maybe um, come up with a result that's more, um, what, like solves the problem better even. So yeah, kudos. So you, you talked about um, how you're conscious of folks in your community who don't have the resources maybe to visit museums or cultural sites in general and how you're, you're thoughtful about that in so, in so far as they can visit. And I'm just wondering, is there anything that you've seen or experienced for activating that, that part of your, your audience and people that live there? that kind of inspires you or makes you want to do more, anything that way? Yeah, there's a lot that makes us want to do more. And I, I always say a big boundary for us as well, and it's the same boundary as visitors coming to us. We're a self-funded independent museum, so everything we do, we need to find the money and the budget for to start with. Um, we don't just have a budget at the beginning of the year, for example, where we can go, I'll tell you what, we're going to do 20 community events this year. We look at it and literally... If we can only afford to do 10, we only do 10. If we can afford to do 30, we do 30, for example. But at the same point, we understand they, like from a public's point of view and a community's point of view, they have them same boundaries. Um, I think a big boundary for us is because part of our museum has got the story of policing in here, there is a lot of um, communities that, for example, either don't like the police or don't want to interact with the police or I've just got them natural boundaries that are there that we try and break down with, well, I'll tell you what, come and have a look at what policing was like in the Victorian times and when our building was open. Let's look at your individual story. So let's look at a early female police officer's story. Let's look at um, an early Polish police officer that's come to the UK and started working as a police officer. And let's look at the difficulties they've had as well. But also their interaction with the emergency services. And I think, especially this year with it being the NHS's 75th anniversary, so our, our National Health Service, I think that is a very different service to everywhere else in the world, I think. And, for example, we will get a lot of students that come over here to our universities and things that, and into the community in general that think if they have a medical emergency, they're, they're going to ring 999, but they're going to get charged for that service. And therefore actually don't ring 999 even though you need it because it's them boundaries and i think we always say it's we teach vital life safety through hands-on learning with history so it's, it's a mixture of very modern and very safety and trying to break down them boundaries as well and we do a lot of work for example with the police on instead of taking a modern police car out to a school gala for example or school event we take one of our old vintage police cars out and so we've been saying to some of the police officers, actually, just, just wear normal clothes. Don't wear sort of your, your full police uniform. Come with us with the vintage vehicles. We'll go out into your local communities and we'll have a chat with people about that because you're a bit more approachable then as well. And at the end of the day, every service man and woman that is in uniform, they don't have a uniform. They have a normal life, the same as the rest of us as well. They are, everybody is real people, no one's robots. And it, it's there is always a hassle on breaking that down, but it's something we always do try and do. And again, being hands-on and interactive helps with that. So, you know, we, we can stumble upon things perhaps in our own institutions that um, gain us more success than maybe we thought we would get. And you're, you're seeing lots of success. I'm, I'm wondering if there's things that you would uh, want other institutions to think about um, that they could uh, that they could do themselves to to make them a more meaningful place. I think say, especially here in the UK, it's showing now that museums are changing massively. And I think what I always say to everyone is, um, it doesn't take as many people as you think to make something happen. I understand certain museums have got lots of different uh, boundaries to break down the self internally, uh, whether it be stuck with budgets, for example, or having to follow a council or a government guideline because they are technically a council or a government museum. 
But then you've got the exact same on the complete opposite end of the scale of small independent museums that just physically don't think they can afford to do that. So therefore, they don't think they've got enough people. And I think, like I said earlier as well, is just printing things off yourself, giving somebody a piece of paper that just has a map on it and you put little crosses everywhere where there's things that they can do or actually it might be a little bit dark in these areas, guys, um, as you're walking around the museum. It, it, you don't have to have that map professionally done. You can, you can literally print something off because you have to remember that the visitor that's coming in, any little bit of help and support they can get is going to make their day a, a hell of a lot better. And that all that sometimes doesn't cost. And I think, again, you can look at things completely different. So I think when I mentioned about sensory backpacks, you can put some sensory items into your gift shop for sale. So therefore, the money coming from the sale of them sensory items go back into the sensory parts of the museum that you're putting in and making it open and better for people with autism, dyspraxia, and uh, every different type that you can... There's lots of boundaries you can you can go through. And I think just speak to... Not the community that's guaranteed to come in, but speak to the community that don't come into a museum. It's why aren't they interacting? Because it could be something really simple. Um, and I think sometimes people do look a bit too beyond something and actually wind it down, look at the simpler side of it. Um, that sort of, you can get them things in place quite quickly and easy then, rather than having to go through massive sort of, um, processing uh, procedures or everything. So I've asked you lots of questions, but maybe I haven't asked the right question to uh, get something that you want to share that, that's really important to you. Is there anything kind of as we wrap up that you want to say? I think from our point of view, just be forward and be yourself. Um, be imaginative. Um, have a look at the museum that you're running in everyone's eyes as well as your own because you do end up living in a museum. And I, I joke and I say I probably live here more than... I'm at home sort of thing. And it, it, it does become part of your life. But enjoy everything that you do um, is something I've always said to all of our team. And put your heart and soul into it because the best feeling is seeing public come back and enjoying what you've done and you put your heart and soul into doing. And just smash them barriers down wherever you possibly can, whether it be between how you're funded or your local communities and whether it's the right thing or the wrong thing, I always say I never really take no for an answer and it's not a, an arrogant thing. It's I always think, okay, it's a no this way, but could we do it that way? Could we find another way around it? And I think especially here in the UK is everyone does rely on a lot of the bigger funding grants, for example, the National Lottery Heritage Fund that is amazing in everything it does, but in some situations like, for example, the building we're housed in, we're just not able to physically get some of the bigger grants that are out there and available because of how we sort of how our building is. But don't mean don't let that stop you from doing anything internal and looking at doing some other things because there's smaller grants from the same organizations, for example, that's available to do smaller projects within and I think just go for it and don't don't sit and wait is all I keep saying. Right on. Okay, well this was uh inspiring for me for a Friday right before the weekend. So I'm grateful that you, you shared this time with me, Matt. Yeah, I'm and I'm sorry, impressed I'm with what you're doing too. <laughs> like doubling your attendance is just amazing. That's really cool, so. Thank you. Okay. We're, uh, we're all extremely passionate in what we do. So sometimes it, it, it comes across a little bit too much, but <laughs> it's, yeah. um, no, I think all our team's passionate about being here and I think the museum world now is passionate about what it does in every role. Well, the people in this industry don't lack passion. I mean, they're, they love, they love heritage and culture. So, all right. Best wishes on your weekend. Yeah. Thank you. You too.